Welcome to the Eat for Endurance podcast. My name is Claire Shornstein, and I am a board certified sports dietitian and endurance athlete. I provide virtual nutrition services through my private practice, Eat for Endurance, and I host this podcast because I love to share the nutrition stories of both professional and recreational athletes and team up with my sports dietitian colleagues to discuss a variety of important nutrition topics. So, It's been a really long time since I've done a solo episode on the show. Like, I can't even remember the last time, Um, probably years. But I did have a little break between guests, and I figured, why not tackle an important nutrition topic by myself for once? Um, I know solo episodes aren't for everyone, but I think you'll want to stick around for this one, as I have a ton of great nutrition tips for you all today. So this is episode number 98. Woohoo! And it is a deep dive into recovery nutrition. Many of my clients are training for some exciting events this fall, and I'm getting lots of questions about what to eat after exercise. And of course, even if you're not training for an event, recovery nutrition is so, so important. So today I'm going to teach you all about the main components of recovery, specific nutrition and hydration guidelines for recovery, how to apply these guidelines to real life as meals and snacks so that you know exactly what to eat after a long run or whatever endurance activity or other workout you are doing. So before we dive in, just a few quick updates. I may as well update you about myself a little bit since this is a solo episode. Um, As some of you may know, I have unfortunately been battling a soft tissue injury since April. That has been super, super frustrating. It's gotten in the way of all my running and racing plans for this fall. Um, And I've been pretty inactive or, you know, relatively for the most part. I did start swimming, which if you follow me on social media, you've probably seen. It's been insanely hard and humbling, but also fun. Um, And I've really been appreciating all the tips that I've gotten from my followers on things like, hey, your swim cap is on sideways. Because, okay, I'm sorry. It's just really not intuitive that the fold goes like this way. I guess I'm for my video people (laughs) showing, but it just, uh, yeah. So I was wearing that the wrong way. Uh, But you guys have been giving me gear racks and forum suggestions and so many and just encouragement, which I really appreciate because... If you didn't see my post about it, I basically for my entire life, even though I learned to swim when I was little, for my entire life told myself I was a terrible swimmer and just kind of convinced myself of that. Um, But I actually can swim and I just, I mean, I can't do it that well yet, but um, it's been a fun journey. So I'm actually about to go swim right after I record this. Um, But yeah, I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. It's, you know, even though I'm not really running so much, I'm doing literally two, four mile runs a week and can barely do that. And it sucks, but um, trying to do some other things to stay active. So if anyone else is injured uh, right now, I feel you. It's not fun, but you know, we do what we need to do to get healed up and keep going. And of course, recovery, nutrition, um, well, just nutrition generally is super important for that. Um, Also, one other quick announcement, then we'll dive into the content for today. I haven't done an Ask Me Anything episode in literally two years. I just checked. And I asked uh, people to give me their questions, to throw in their questions on Instagram and Instagram story. But you know, the algorithm is you never really know what's going on. I don't think many people saw it. Um, And I know that you guys have questions. I absolutely know you guys have questions. So I would love for you to send me your questions, whether it's, you know, to my email, claire at eatforendurance.com. You can use the contact form on my website, eatforendurance.com. You can DM me on Instagram whatever works best for you, however you want to send it. I know you guys have tons of nutrition questions for me, so send them my way. Let's get them on the episode. And as soon as I have enough to do an episode, I'll put that out there. All right. So let's get into recovery nutrition for endurance athletes. So where, where should we start with this? So I want to go over recovery basics. And by that, you know, I mean, nutrition, rest, sleep, and life stress. Those are kind of the pieces of the puzzle, right? So there's really no magic bullet, as you guys all know, when it comes to recovery. You cannot simply throw back a protein shake and call it a day. Uh, Recovery really is a complex puzzle that involves all these different things. So nutrition, sleep, rest, life stress, those are the things that we're kind of keeping an eye on. Um, Even if you are crushing your nutrition plan and everything else in your life is like absolutely out of whack, like you're overtraining and you're not sleeping well and you're like mega stressed out, et cetera, you're going to feel like garbage, right? So we can't just like work on one thing and expect it to all go okay. We, we kind of have to have our, our eyes on a bunch of different things, which by the way, I know is hard. I get it. Um, so yeah. And it's also worth mentioning that, you know, even though we're focusing on what to eat after 
mostly like a long or hard session or a race. That's often when we think about recovery. Recovery nutrition absolutely applies to shorter runs and other workouts as well. So, you know, we really want to think about context and the bigger picture of nutrition goals. All of that matters. So recovery nutrition, yes, it's super important in the context of like post hard, long exercise race, but it's also important for anyone at any time. So just keep that in mind. All right. So which nutrients do we need to recover? So if you just finished a long run or any other type of endurance activity, you need to replace the fluids and the salts that you lost to sweat. You also need to eat carbs to refill your stores that were lowered during exercise, potentially depleted, depending on what you did. And you also need protein to repair and rebuild your muscle tissues that were also, you know, partially broken down. So if you're building a recovery meal, then you also really want to be including healthy fats to help you absorb all those nutrients you're eating. It also helps you meet your increased needs as an athlete um, and hopefully reducing inflammation if you're consuming the right types of fats. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and lastly, you want fruits and veggies, aka color, to provide a variety of micronutrients, antioxidants, as well as fiber. We're going to get into way more details on all these different things. Again, I'm just kind of like setting the landscape here, setting the stage, and, and introducing a few things. So timing. Timing is something that is talked about a lot when it comes to recovery nutrition. And here's the thing to keep in mind. Recovery is not just a box that you tick like, oh, cool. I just finished my long run. Oh, I had my shake tick. Okay. I'm done. <laughs> like recovery really is an ongoing process. So what I like to think about or explain to people is you can kind of divide recovery into two phases. So first phase is immediately after exercise. That's probably the one you've heard about the most because it's usually emphasized the most. But the second phase is really just like the rest of the day and beyond. And that's equally important. Okay, because again, you can't just have that one meal, that one shake, whatever, and then you're done. And the reason I mention that is because a lot of times people like have a meal and then maybe they lose their appetite and they don't want to eat and it kind of they kind of like really pay attention to that first thing and then just they're on the couch or doing get busy, whatever. And we'll go over that in a second. So typically it's recommended that you refuel within, you know, 30 to 60 minutes of finishing exercise. Now, the thing to note, you know, does the door to recovery slam shut um, if you don't eat within that hour? No, no, it does not. But practically speaking, it really makes sense to refuel within an hour or as close to this time frame as possible and preferably close to when you finish exercise, especially after um, a long session or a race. And that's just because your body, your body is so well primed for the nutrition, giving you just depleted yourself. It's ready to replenish, um, rehydrate and repair, right? Um, also, this first window of recovery really is just a great eating opportunity within the overall context of your day. So for instance, let's say you're heading to work after your run and you'll have time to eat again for several hours. If you're waiting too long, you may fall behind in your eating um, for that day and really pay for it later. And, and I'm sure we've all been there. Like it does not feel good. Um, and there are, of course, other examples. That's just one. So it's important to eat adequately each and every day and consistently throughout the day to really be meeting your overall nutrition needs. Um, otherwise, you're really not going to fully recover. So, um, and as we know, if you're not, you know, eating adequately, both your health and your performance will suffer. Okay. And if you'd like, by the way, to learn more about meeting everyday nutrition needs, because I'm not really talking about that in this episode, I do have a great blog post um, about that called how much do I need to eat as an endurance athlete? You can go find it over on my website under the blog section, got lots of stuff over there, including by the way, what I'm talking about here, like literally all in written form. So you do not need to be taking notes. You can go over to my recovery nutrition blog and get all this information in blog post form if you desire. All right. So one thing I'm sure you've experienced or maybe you've at least heard about is having a reduced appetite after a long or hard workout. And I just referenced that. Um, and if you have, if this is a regular thing for you, you are definitely not alone. I too experienced this. Low appetite is really, really common immediately after a long or challenging session or a race. And that's because exercise impacts levels of certain hormones, which in turn affect your appetite. So, um, and then there are other things at play, for instance, like dehydration or other fueling challenges during exercise that can further reduce your desire or your ability to eat. So, and that's not a great situation, but as I've 
talked about before and posted about like just because you're not hungry that doesn't change the fact that you like you need to eat you can't just rely on your body's signals as a busy active person especially not as an endurance athlete because that's going to lead to underfueling we know that um and that's not a fun destination i promise you so don't ignore how you feel but do be more intentional with your meals and your snacks so for instance instead of skipping a meal um, you can just change your fueling strategy, and I'm going to walk you through what that could look like. All right, so the next thing to talk about, again, we're kind of in this recovery basics phase right now of our episode. Um, it's rest and sleep, and that's where the magic happens, right? You need adequate rest from exercise to give your body a chance to actually recover and adapt to the training that you're doing. Um, and I'm not just talking about rest days here. You know, we're also thinking about like variations in your training and also the many different forms of movement in your daily life that may increase your total energy expenditure or get in the way of recovering after a long effort. And I'm mentioning this because I frequently work with, you know, busy athletes, recreational athletes who, in addition to training, they're also walking their dog multiple times a day, or maybe they're biking or walking as forms of transportation. If you live in a big city like New York, you are walking everywhere, right? So you're really moving a lot. And that's great, but you guys you guys have to keep that in mind, right? Maybe you're standing on your feet or walking around as part of your job. I work with a lot of people in the healthcare industry and some people are just putting so much time on feet. And that really adds a lot um, to your energy expenditure when you just, again, look at the entire picture of what you're doing. Maybe you're doing hours of yard work. I mean, my God, I love to garden and it like kills me. So like that is movement that counts. So people think these activities don't count, but they really do. So having an active lifestyle on top of the training that you're already doing, it just means you have to pay extra attention to eating enough as well as carving out time to truly rest your body. And then of course, speaking of rest, we need adequate sleep, ideally seven to eight hours a night. And um, that's a huge challenge for people, um, myself included. And there are just so many things that get in the way of sleep, um, whether it's kids or pets or work schedules, travel, you know, perimenopause, menop- I mean, they're just like a million things that can interrupt sleep. Um, so again, I'm not going to deep dive into this. That's like, that could be a whole separate episode. Actually, I should totally do a sleep episode. That's a great idea. Um, but just wanted to mention it here because it is an important piece of recovery. So just trying to improve your sleep hygiene wherever you can. So including, you know, setting appropriate boundaries for technology. I will confess I'm really bad at that. I look at my phone literally right up until when I go to sleep and it's the first thing I do when I get up in the morning, something I'm personally working on. Um, but you know, you can think about what helps you prepare for sleep, whether it's a hot shower or reading that always kind of makes me sleepy at least. Um, and making time for those things. All right. Um, again, sometimes sleep is out of your control. Just do your best. If you're in a season of life where sleep is chronically bad, like hello, fellow parents of young children, then you may just need to adjust your performance expectations. All right. And then the last thing I just want to mention here is stress. And by that, I mean life stress, but also physical stress. So, and I, and I want to be clear about something here. I know that many people exercise to relieve stress. And I totally get it. I love to run and work out and exercise supports my overall health and well-being. Also, life is just really overwhelming and stressful at times with two little kids running a small business like you guys get it. Um, But here's the thing. Exercise is not a form of stress management. It's actually a form of stress on the body. And if you become overloaded with stress, whether that's physical or mental your recovery, your performance, and your overall health will suffer. I feel like that's a refrain I say a million times, right? But but truly, like that can't be the tool, only tool in your stress relief toolbox. We need to make sure, like, yes, you can, that can be part of stress relief, but that is not your whole system. So you need to make sure that you have other things, whether it's music or creative hobbies, cooking, hanging out with a friend, reading, whatever it is that floats your boat. Please make sure that you have other things you can turn to when you're feeling stressed and overwhelmed because you cannot always turn to exercise. All right. So we set the stage. Let's get into the details now of recovery nutrition. So after a long training session or whatever you're doing, you know, the very first thing you should do is begin the process of rehydration. You can do this by drinking a sports drink, which just to be super clear about that, because people get confused, that is a fluid with carbs and electrolytes or an electrolyte beverage. That would be like your, you know, something that has electrolytes. Again, that means sodium. I have to point this out because I just did a whole 
a little mini review of Prime, which is not a sports drink or electrolyte beverage. But um, electrolyte beverage would have, you know, sodium primarily, but it'd have other electrolytes and it typically doesn't have carbs. So you can do that or you can have plain water um, or whatever fluids you're having with food that contains sodium and other salts. All right. There are many ways to do this. There's never just one way. So as a general starting point, try to drink roughly 16 to 24 ounces of fluid after, um, after exercise. But do remember that fluid and sodium targets for re rehydration really need to be individualized um, based on you because your individual losses just they're very unique to you. Um, they depend on your individual sweat rate, your sweat composition, what is the weather of, you know, where you're doing your exercise or altitude, exercise duration and intensity. There are a lot of things when it comes to hydration that you have to personalize to you and your situation. So please keep that in mind. I have some great resources that you can read. Um, again, this isn't a hydration episode. It's just one piece. But if you really want to deep dive into hydration, I have a whole blog post called Hydration for Endurance Athletes. I also have a blog about how to test your sweat rate and that goes into all of that. Um, so check those out. All right. Now, once you test your sweat rate, and if you don't know what that is, that is your fluid loss, um, you know, ounces per hour. Um, so we're determining what that is and you're trying to drink about 125 to 150% of what you lose. So more than what you lose. And another way to think about it is 20 to 24 ounces per pound um, that you lose. Right. So if this doesn't make sense, go to, go to my website, eforendurance.com, go read those resources I just pointed out. I'll put them in the show notes as well. So, and we're trying to, you know, drink this amount within four hours or less. So what are some popular rehydration options? So you could reach for, of course, sports drinks. You could have salty, carb-rich foods with water. You could have chocolate milk plus sodium-containing foods or fluids. Um, you could have recovery drinks, which typically contain protein, carbs, and electrolytes. Smoothies are great. Um, really juicy, watery fruits like watermelon plus a sodium-containing food or fluid. Or actually what I love to do is just throw a bunch of watermelon in a blender with ice and put some salt in there. It's really tasty. Um, you can do a broth-based soup um, that typically has lots of sodium. Um, so that's just, you know, some examples. And to be clear, as long as you are not continuing to exercise and sweat, you really don't need to keep sipping electrolyte drinks all day long, right? I see people like, you know, putting noon in their water bottles or element or all these things that have um, lots of sodium and they're just drinking them all day long. Sometimes they're doing it for flavor. Um, it's just not necessary. These products aren't cheap. Um, you can get salt in your foods, you know, liberally salt your food. Endurance athletes typically really do not need to worry about sodium intake um, unless you have, you know, medical condition like hypertension where I'm really not worrying about it at all. Most people are not doing enough. Um, and you can get your other electrolytes, you know, magnesium, pot potassium, calcium, all that. You get that through a variety of other foods. Um, you know, so magnesium, potassium, that's in a lot of plant foods. Calcium can come from dairy. Um, there's some other calcium rich foods in there. So you can really kind of rely on the diet to get that in as well. So again, check out that blog post, Hydration for Endurance Athletes. That'll have a lot of information for you. All right. What about carbs and protein? That's we hear a lot about carbs and protein a lot in the context of recovery, um, but particularly protein. I'd say that protein is the, the the macronutrient that gets like all the attention. But recovery nutrition is not just about protein, as hopefully you know if you've been listening to this podcast. Carbs are crucial too. Um, so we need enough carbs to refill our muscle and uh, liver glycogen tanks. And you need enough protein, specifically enough of the essential amino acids, meaning the ones you can't make in the body, um, to support muscle protein synthesis. And muscle protein synth synthesis, if you don't know what that means, that's just a fancy way of saying building new muscle, which is key to exercise recovery. Additionally, you need to eat carbs and protein at the same time, especially if you have less time to recover. And that's because you can make glycogen more quickly when you add protein to your carbs and you can, um, and adding carbs to your protein also helps to increase muscle protein synthesis rates. So they work really, really beautifully together in that way. We want to, they're best, let's, keep, let's just think of them as best friends, okay? Protein, carbs, they're besties. We want to keep them together, consume them together. Um, all right. I'm going to throw some numbers around because we're going to get into some guidelines. If you like to take notes, sure, but I'm just going to remind you, you can also, again, go to my recovery nutrition blog, blog post on my website and all this information is like written out for you so you don't have to <laughs> remember everything. 
Um, the thing to know about guidelines is that they differ based on what you just did and how much time you have until your next long or hard session. So essentially, the less time you have to recover, the more aggressive you need to be with your nutrition, especially with replenishing your carb stores. So here, the scenario I'm going to focus on today is you just finished a long training run or another endurance type of training session or race, and you have at least 12 hours to recover before, before your next session. Um, because that's the one that we, most people find themselves in. Um, and you have a decent amount of time to recover and refuel with, with that time frame. Um, so as discussed earlier, um, it's still recommended to reach recovery recommendations within that first hour after your long session, if able. Um, but, you know, just do your best. So if you want a general recommendation, you if you don't if you don't weigh yourself and you just don't want to use weight based guidelines, um, I'm going to throw out some numbers that you can use as really like a rough starting point. So we want to be aiming for roughly 50 to 90 grams or more of carbohydrate and 20 to 40 grams or more of protein. That protein one, I'd say 20 is really low. Most people I'm really not going that low for. I'm most people, especially if you're like 35 and up, and especially my women, we're going 30s and 40s, sometimes even higher, um, again, depending on what your needs are. But again, these are just some general ranges I'm throwing out there if you want a starting point for you. And then, of course, if you'd like to individualize these recommendations based on body weight, you can aim for at least one gram per kilogram of carbohydrate and 0.5 gram per kilogram of protein. And this is, again, for that recovery meal. OK, so this is just for that one time. It's not a range for the day or anything, obviously. Um, so. Another thing to keep in mind is your own protein and carbohydrate needs. It depends on many different things. And that's, you know, your weight, as we just pointed out, your age, your training volume, your performance and fitness goals, et cetera. So please always take these guidelines with a grain of salt. Um, what we, what I do in one-to-one -one nutrition coaching is we really like get into the weeds of that and figure out like what an appropriate amount is for you. This is a very general <laughs> podcast into, I don't even know who's listening to this. So you know, just remember these things um, when I throw out some numbers that it may or may not be appropriate for you. But again, it could be a really great starting point. The other thing I want you to remember is we need to think about like this recovery meal, like what we're trying to go for in the context of your overall needs as an endurance athlete. So, we're, you know, I've mentioned this before and it's in my course and it's on my blog and all this stuff, but roughly five to 12 grams per kilogram of carbohydrate is our overall t uh, goal for the day and about 1.4 to two, sometimes higher grams per kilogram of protein per day. So that's like the total needs, right? But again, this is just a starting point. Um, if you want to resupply your carb store stores fully, and especially if like you have something else big coming up, um, the guideline to restock your carb stores within 24 hours is one gram per kilogram per hour of carbs for four to six hours after your long session or race. So that's a bit more aggressive, obviously. Um, and it's especially important if you're doing like back-to-back -back long or hard runs or if you're doing a multi-day event or something like that. And the message isn't, by the way, that you need to eat every hour. You can consolidate your eating into meals and snacks, but you also just can't eat one recovery meal and think you're good to go. And same with protein, right? You have to keep feeding the recovery machine. Try to have a protein-rich meal or snack every three to four hours to keep the recovery process going and to meet your overall daily needs. So what types of carbs are best, you may be wondering, or not, I'm going to talk about it anyways, <laughs> right after a long uh, session or a race, it's best to consume easy to digest lower fiber carbs that can be absorbed quickly to help restock your glycogen stores faster. So the less time you have to recover, the more important this becomes. So these types of carbs are less filling, and that allows you to get a greater amount in and to meet your carb goals, carb goals more easily. And then at your next meal, you can choose more fiber-rich foods like whole grains and beans and legumes and all of that. So there are many liquids and solid foods that are, um, that are providing rapidly absorbed carbohydrates, such as chocolate milk, that's always a favorite, sports drinks or recovery drinks, things like, you know, bread products, bagels like that, you know, banana, energy bars, yogurt, rice, pasta, potatoes, all that kind of stuff. Um, and of course, these should all be part of a snack or a meal with other components, right? So these are just examples 
of some, you know, easy to digest, simple carbs that you can reach for. And just to clarify, I'm not saying that you can't have any whole wheat bread or brown rice or whatever else you enjoy as part of your recovery meal. However, if you did like a really demanding session or a race, it's a lot easier to hit your nutrition targets, um, including your increased energy needs with less food volume if you're including some lower fiber carb options. All right. So hopefully that makes sense. Leucine. Leucine is another important topic when we talk about recovery nutrition and specifically in the context of protein, because leucine is a branch chain essential amino acid. And it's really, really important, especially for endurance athletes. It's an energy source during endurance exercise, which you may or may not know. Um, it also plays a key role in building muscle. But before you rush off and like waste your money on branch chain amino acid supplements or adding leucine to everything, please don't do that. Research shows that you'll get the biggest increase in muscle protein synthesis if you consume leucine along with adequate amounts of the other essential amino acids consistently and adequately throughout the day. All right. So real food, you can do this by eating real food. <laughs> so there are lots of different leucine rich foods um, that you can reach for things like steak, chicken, salmon, tuna, eggs, yogurt, tofu and tempeh, edamame, beans and oats. Those are just some examples. Um, and of course, as part of your recovery meal, um, just to give you a, a guideline here, we're going for roughly one to three grams of leucine to stimulate muscle building. And you're going to hit this amount, by the way, if you're consuming about 20 to 40 grams of protein from any of those sources I just listed or a combination because we love to layer proteins. Layering proteins is great. All I mean by that is maybe you're including a smaller amount of chicken, but you're including beans and all these other things, right? Um, but let's say you want to have it from a single source. You could have like three whole eggs or four to six ounces of chicken, steak, or fish, or tofu, plus beans, one cup Greek yogurt, things like that. Fats. All right, moving on to the third macronutrient, also very important when it comes to recovery nutrition. Um, there are no specific weight-based guidelines for recovery when it comes to fat or really for anything when it comes to fat. Um, your needs really do depend on how much energy you require per day and a number of other factors. But fat is important in this context um, for a number of reasons, which we'll get into. Um, mostly we want to be aiming for, and this is the same if you're just talking about health, um, aiming for unsaturated fats like avocado and olives, olive oil, nuts, seeds, fatty fish, um, et cetera, as part of what you eat to add um, you know, much needed energy. It's making food taste good, right? It's filling. It helps fight some of the inflammation that exercise causes. And omega-3 fatty acids in particular are considered anti-inflammatory, which I'm sure you guys have heard about already. Um, and they're very critical, um, a critical component to our overall health. Um, let's get it. Actually, let, let's dive into that a little bit deeper. Um, probably worth mentioning as some people are confused about omega-3s and the different types and all that good stuff. So EPA and DHA are the forms of omega-3s that we need to consume, and they come from marine sources like salmon, sardines, mackerel, anchovies, herring, trout, and tuna. ALA is another type of omega-3, and that is what is found in plant foods like walnuts, soybean, canola oils, and flax and chia seeds. You know, you always hear people say, oh, like walnuts have, you know, omega-3s and flax seeds and all this stuff. It's a different type. And the thing to know here is that you can convert ALA into EPA and DHA, but it's not at an efficient rate. So it's really hard to meet your needs just with plants. Um, and of course, endurance sports like distance running <laughs> puts, they put you in a higher state of inflammation, which really makes it important to meet your omega-3 needs. So you can get adequate omega-3s through the diet, but really only if you're consistently eating seafood about two to four times a week, depending on the serving size. Um, I know I don't, I eat like everything except shellfish and uh, I definitely do not meet my needs through the diet, which is why I personally choose to supplement. A lot of my clients do not, I'd say most of my clients are not meeting it through the diet um, and choose to supplement. So you can absolutely consider um, supplementing and it can be with a fish oil. If you don't mind having fish, it can be an algal oil if you're vegan, um, if you're unable to get what you need through food. All right, so lastly, fruits and vegetables. That is another really critical part of recovery meals and snacks, um, and they contribute much needed micronutrients, antioxidants, and fiber, and all of that, of course, really impacts recovery and general health. I want to specifically shout out polyphenols here. Um, we've definitely talked about that on the podcast before. I think in my plant 
based uh, diet episode with Kelly Jones. Um, but polyphenols are a class of compounds that are naturally found in plant foods, and they have high levels of antioxidants as well as anti-inflammatory qualities. Um, they can help reduce muscle soreness, improve performance, benefit gut health, and help with sleep, among other things. And they're broken down into a bunch of different groups. Um, just to name a few, it's uh, ling. I'm going to say this wrong. Lingnans. Am I pronouncing that right? Sorry if I'm not. Lingnans. It's L-I-G-N-A-N-S. Phenolic acids. Still bends. I'm probably pronouncing that one wrong, but um, uh, that's like resveratrol in grapes, for instance, and flavonoids. And we find polyphenols in brightly colored fruits, such as the ones. Um, uh, actually, you can find there's a whole picture in my blog, but like, you know, things like, you know, uh, different berries, blueberries, you know, red, red grapes, like all those different things. Um, lots of black currants, like all that kind of stuff. So it's worth noting um, that research on polyphenols has largely been focused on tart cherries as well as New Zealand black currants. There are tons of products on the market, like capsules and drinks and stuff like that. Um, that contain these specific fruits in very concentrated amounts. And you can absolutely supplement with these things if needed. Um, many athletes choose to do that. Uh, you know, they're often in a very convenient, non-perishable form. And um, it's, it's very convenient when your training volume is high and, you know, those things are available to you. But you can also just focus on consuming whole fruits and veggies. Just want to make that clear. Um, for instance, like the polyphenol amount in many research studies um, can be achieved by having about two cups of mixed berries or one small basket of blueberries, and you can eat those amounts like throughout the day. But of course, not everyone wants to or has access to these things. So, you know, something to keep in mind. And then, of course, variety is really important when it comes to fruits and vegetables in the context of health and recovery. So, you know, we want to be consuming more than just the polyphenols. I just wanted to shout them out because uh, they do have some research behind them and are beneficial. The last thing I want to say in this context is that you should not be taking antioxidant supplements. So like vitamin E, vitamin C, et cetera, after exercise in large doses, especially because excessive amounts of antioxidants in supplemental form versus, you know, getting these in foods can interfere with training adaptations, um, you know, and everything you're trying to accomplish essentially. So um, please remember that not all inflammation is bad. We do want some. Um, and so, yeah, just wanted to kind of point that out. All right, so I've just thrown a ton of information at you. Now, how do we put all of this into action in real life? Um, I often talk about how there's no one right way to do things when it comes to nutrition, and obviously recovery nutrition is no exception. Um, so here are three strategies you can use to hit your post-exercise refueling goals. So number one, you can have a full meal, hitting your nutrition targets within the hour, as we've mentioned, right? Number two, you can have a shake or a snack immediately after exercise, followed by a balanced meal 60 to 90 minutes later. That's a popular one. Number three, you can have a nutrition-packed smoothie plus a carb-rich solid food within an hour. So kind of essentially combining one and two. Um, and if you're not sure which strategy is best for you, um, I guess just consider your running and eating schedule. Number one, you know, what is your access to solid food? Are you kind of like traveling to a trailhead or traveling back or whatever, you know, so keep in mind like what your access is. Appetite. Some people really need to lean on liquid nutrition and also food preferences. All right. So as I mentioned, you know, that second strategy is so popular because a lot of people, they really don't want to eat right away. They would prefer to drink, you know, it's a nice way to get a little extra uh, fluids in. Um, it's quick and easy. And then they can kind of focus on having a solid meal a little bit later. So let's go through these quickly. Um, if you want to go straight to a full meal, um, you, for instance, could have like a four to six ounce of piece of, you know, salmon or chicken or meat or tofu beans or eggs or whatever it is that you're doing. You're throwing in some color. So your fruits and veg, you're making sure some fat's present. You're getting those simple carbs in with rice or pasta or whatever it is you want to, you know, throw in there. If you are having a smoothie or shake, I would recommend that you're aiming for at least 20 or preferably 30 grams of protein and at least 30 to 60 grams of carbs in that liquid nutrition, right? So trying to really pack some in, it's not like having a glass of chocolate milk is fantastic. That is not adequate, especially if you're going to be waiting a while to get a proper meal in. Okay. So really, you know, you certainly could have like chocolate milk plus something else, or you could throw the chocolate milk into your smoothie, which I definitely do sometimes. Um, but yeah, just something to keep in mind. Um, 
And then of course your solid meal, you're including additional protein and carbs along with your fruits and veg and whatever. Okay. And then together those things are meeting those targets and maybe even going above it. Um, okay. What else do I want to do? Ah, I want to talk about protein supplements. So it's worth noting, no one needs protein supplements. Okay. Which, uh, you know, of course includes powders, ready to drink shakes and bars, You can easily make smoothies with protein sources like Greek yogurt and soy milk and nuts and seeds and all these different things, oats, et cetera. Um, You can also eat protein-rich solid foods. But protein supplements in all of their forms, they're very popular. They're very convenient for some athletes in particular, like vegans and vegetarians or people who are frequently on the go or, again, people who struggle with appetite or whatever it is. These products are so helpful in meeting protein goals. And I personally regularly use protein supplements and often recommend them to my athletes. So no shame if you're using protein supplements, protein powders. Um, but again, no one <laughs> just want to point out, like no one needs them for recovery. Technically speaking, if you're going to use them, here's what I want you to know. I want you to choose a protein powder that provides at least 20 grams of protein per serving. And if the amino acid profile is on there, then at least two grams of leucine per serving. All right. But it might not be on there. Um, So at least focus on the overall protein content. Whey protein is considered the gold standard because it's absorbed quickly, it's digested well, and has a really great amino acid profile, including high leucine content. Um, So if you do whey, pick a product that uses whey isolates or a combo of isolates and concentrates to ensure you're getting mostly protein. Plant-based protein powders, they're also a great choice. If you prefer that, that's awesome. There's no problem there. Um, Some may have uh, some enzymes added to them to increase their digestibility. And we're really ideally trying to get a blend of different types. So like pea plus rice or soy versus a single protein source to provide an adequate amino acid profile. Also, pay attention to what's in your powder. You know, if you're having, you're seeing things like sugar alcohols, so words that end in OL, like sorbitol, um, that can cause GI issues. And then also some people just don't like the taste of certain sweeteners like stevia or monk fruit or all that. I personally like to keep things super simple. I go for unflavored whey um, isolate products, like, you know, from now, Momentous, Clean Athlete, those are a few of my favorites. Um, But, but yeah, you know, I know people, some people don't mind it. So see what works for you. Um, most pro- protein powders are fairly low, if not very low in carbs, um, recovery drinks. Those are different by the way, just, I want to draw a distinction there. Those usually contain carbs, protein, um, and some electrolytes, and they sometimes have less protein than like a, a protein powder. Um, so this is totally fine. If you get a protein focused product, it, it just means that you have to add carbohydrate, whether it's in the, the liquid itself and the shake you're putting together, or if it's something on the side. So if you want to make a shape adding, you know, or sh- not shake, shake, <laughs> you want to add a shake, um, add things to your shake. It could be things like fruit, honey, milk, juice, oats. Um, or again, you can always have it on the side. Um, always try to choose a product that is third party tested if possible. So NSF certified for sport or informed choice or examples Supplements, as you know, are poorly regulated and it's just good to know what you're putting in your body, right? So um, I like, um, you know, a number of third-party tested products like Garden of Life, Momentus, Clean Athlete, Now Sports, Thorn, Vega. There are many others. And there are, of course, reputable brands that are not third-party tested. So I don't want to say like you can never do that, but if you can, go for third-party tested. And last but not least, please do not use collagen as a protein powder. All right. Collagen is a poor quality protein. It is not a good source of leucine. So this is not a good protein source. I see people throwing collagen in their post run shake all the time. um, And this is just not a correct use of the supplement. If you want to use collagen to help with arthritis or other injuries, I mean, the protocol is like 10 to 15 grams of collagen along with a vitamin C source before exercise, not after. All right. So collagen is fine. It's a great supplement, just not as a protein source. All right. Um, The last thing I want to say, is this last thing I want to say? Yes. Athlete performance plates. Um, It's a really great tool for all meals, including recovery, nutrition. And it's really, you can show how like meals change on different training, uh, training days and in different phases of the training cycle. Um, I already mentioned that blog post where I cover, you know, how I think it's how much do I need to eat as an endurance athlete. That's the name of that post. So this is a visual tool. I'm not going to go over it on this podcast. Doesn't make sense. Um, And then the very, very last thing I want to say is 
Meals are really important, but we can't forget about snacks. Strategic snacks are so important to meeting your recovery goals because they're going to help you stay on track with all of your nutrition goals for the overall day. They're allowing you to restock your carb stores and meet your daily protein needs as well. So as a general rule of thumb, try not to go more than three to four hours without eating a meal or snack. All right. Um, and if appetite is low, drink a snack, right? We've already discussed some options there. Um, and I also recommend that you add a high protein and carb rich snack after dinner. If you can, this is really crucial. If let's say you're eating dinner early, um, an evening snack will really help with muscle recovery and set you up for a good night's sleep. Um, don't eat like right before bed, but maybe you're allowing like, you know, 30 to 60 minutes or so to digest if you can. So popular options, yogurt with granola and or fruit. You can, of course, top with some chocolate chips if you want to make it more fun. Smoothies, cereal with milk, that's one of my favorites, um, or whatever else you enjoy. All right, guys, that's all I have for you today on recovery nutrition. So to summarize, long or hard training sessions and races, they require that you pay extra careful attention to your nutrition but recovery is something that you really should always be focused on to feel your best, even after an easy or short workout. All right. I hope that today's episode inspired you all to dial in your own recovery nutrition and it's given you some ideas um, for after your next uh, training session, long run, whatever you guys are doing. All right. It, again, if you want all of this in, in a written form and even more information, because in this blog post, I cover more, head on over to my website, eforendurance.com. I have a whole blog post on recovery nutrition. If you enjoyed today's episode, I would be so grateful if you could hit follow or subscribe wherever you listen. And if you have a minute, please, please, please rate my show. Give it a five-star rating, review it. It's so helpful to, you know, so other people can find it. If you're able and willing to support the show financially, I do have a Patreon page. I'd love to see you over there. You can donate as little or as much as you want. And there are some great perks if you join. Um, and yeah, that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for your support. And again, send me questions for my Ask Me Anything episode and always feel free to email me with whatever you'd like to share with me, claire at eatforendurance.com. Thank you all so much and I will see you next time.